All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Love What You Do. My name is Sean Dolan, CEO of Pushfire, and today I have Harry Maurer. Harry Maurer is a world-class magician who's performed at Top of the World and Tavern on the Green at the infamous 21 Club. Harry studied theater production at the Mason Gross School of the Arts at Rutgers University in Las Vegas Entertainment Today describes his show best when they said his manner with the audience combined with a magical skill second to none is what the audience remembers after the curtains go down. He's joined comedy legends like Joey Bishop from Sinatra's original Rat Pack, Jackie Vernon, and many others. He's open for the Supremes, Rita Rudner, Ray Romano, Jason Alexander, Richie Jenny, Rosie O'Donnell, Frankie Avalon, US presidents, and international royalty. He was awarded the Atlantic City Entertainer of the Year. Thank you for being here today, Harry Maurer. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's, it's nice to be with you. Likewise. Um, so the reason I started this podcast was to highlight some of the jobs out there that uh, you know people may not know about and, and to get a real understanding of what it's like to do these jobs that people really love doing um, you know, and combining passion with work. And I can't think of a better example than uh, having a world-class comedian uh, here today. Oh, thank you. You know, you're right, though. I mean, people, people, I know so many people who really just work all week long. They hate their jobs yeah. and then they live for the weekends. Yeah. And for me, yeah. I just have a great time doing what I do and I like what I do. You know, I enjoy my, there's a business end of it that's frustrating. You know, there's a part, part of sure. it that's frustrating. There's but work. otherwise, you know, it's a great job. I love what I do. I get to travel the world. I get to see people. I get to make people laugh. I get a lot of applause. How many people get applause at the end of the workday? You know what I mean? It's the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine at the end, at the end of your day job or your end of your job, you're like, can we do it again? <laughs> you know, everyone else is yeah. trying to get home. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so when did you first realize that you wanted to be a magician? You know, I, I always wanted to be an architect when I was a little kid. I, that was my dream. I wanted mm. to be an architect as I, as I was growing up. But magic became such a hobby, and I, got, I became so so involved in it, and then it became more and more successful uh, at, at those yeah. shows that that started becoming a, a, a focus. And I remember... Um, you know, I, you know, by the time I was 13, I was working nightclubs, performing in nightclubs. And by the time really? I was in, yeah, when I was in high school, they used to let me out at lunchtime to work a nightclub down in the Jersey shore where I lived I'd work a nightclub. And then I would go home for dinner and then go back and do the evening shows. And I did that every single night. But I mean, in between wow. that, I was working like these right. touring groups called showbiz kids. We travel around the state. Uh, doing these different shows in different uh, theaters or, or communities or whatever. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, it was something I, I was just good at. I just had a lot of fun with it. And um, it, it, magic, you know, it's funny about magic. Magic is a real incredible study. It's not just performance. There's so much yeah. that has to do with dexterity. There's so much that has to do with research. There's so much that has to do with structuring a show. Um, and, you know, I got to the point when I was in high school in my, I guess it was my junior year or senior year, I sat down with the guidance counselor and the guidance counselor went through these tests and whatever they do. Mm -hmm. And right, right. It, like everything in the test really leaned itself more towards entertainment, which was really, really interesting. And she yeah. recommended that I, uh, su I um, uh, submit my application to what was called the Mason Gross School of the Arts. At the time, it was called the School of Creative and Performing Arts at Rutgers mm -hmm. University. And they only accepted 50 people a year. 25 in wow. the acting department and 25 in the production department. And what made that school such a high end school uh, for theater is that the instructors all were for broad from Broadway. They literally right. an hour away is New York. They would come down, they would actually teach and they'd still go back to New York and do their stuff. So it, it was really interesting because anybody who was considered had to be interviewed. So I went for an interview and during the interview, uh, I explained to them, I'm not here to be an actor. I'm here to learn principles of theater to enhance my magic because I'm a magician. And whether they right. were tickled by that or whatever, they accepted me, which was unbelievable. Amazing. And yeah. even then, you know, and even then during my, my um, I guess it was my, I guess the second, it, maybe it was, it was either my freshman year, it must have been my freshman year of, of college, that I started, I auditioned for the Playboy Club in New York as an mm -hmm. entertainer because they had this open auditions and I got the yeah. job there. And so I ended up going to, from classes 
to classes from eight in the morning until five at night at Rutgers, and then driving an hour to New York and doing two shows a night, three shows Friday, <laughs> three shows Saturday, wow. and coming back for an eight o'clock class in the morning. It was exhausting. Oh my but I got maybe four no hours of sleep at night and caught cat naps in the dressing room and did my homework wow. in between things. And so, I mean, things really kept snowballing. And it, it's really interesting because my life has always just progressed based on what's being offered to me. And it's been really fun. Yeah. Do, do you remember your first trick? First trick? Or an I remember early learning one. my grand. Well, my first, again, there's a lot of card tricks and things like that that people show yeah. you and a little trick where the, like my, my grandfather used to take coins and pull coins out of your ears. And so yeah. he taught me that. But I think the first trick was sure. probably just a trick with these two, uh, two little tiny balls and the one was red and one was green and I'd wrap the red one in the red handkerchief and put it in a glass and a green one in the green handkerchief and put it in the glass and I'd wave my hands and when I lifted up the cloth the two balls had changed places with each other and that was probably yeah. the first trick I learned yeah yeah did you uh did you perform those at school was that something like you were the guy at school and, and would do tricks at school like how did that affect your social life in junior high and high oh school? my gosh you know, it, it, it's, there's always bullies in school and bullies would come sure. up to you and start saying, hey, you know, I want You're they want different. your lunch money and stuff like this. So I'd start yeah. pulling coins out of their ears, you know, and at that <laughs> point, you know, they were shocked and they would start applauding and they'd bring their friends over and I'd do magic for them. Oh, yeah. my God. And at lunch funny. at lunchtime, I used to do like the three shell game where you had three little uh, I used to yeah. I used to use thimbles, I had three thimbles and, and a little piece of foil. And I'd sit there yeah. and we'd bet I actually made money by betting with people on which one it's going to be under. <laughs> so things That's like that amazing. would go on with magic. And I had oh, friends I who were involved in magic in, in high school at the same time. And they they did magic as well. So it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun oh, in, 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 a, in high school. In a, fact, a in high school. Um, I was a member of the band. I used to play French horn in the marching band. And okay. uh, the the band director designed, he decided to design the, our senior year, the entire football um, uh, halftime show around my magic. So we actually did magic wow. on the on the 50 yard line. And we ended up doing that at Giant Stadium for an audience of 60,553 people wow. doing magic on the 50 yard line and on the big, you know, the big screen, you actually saw them, saw us doing the magic on the big screen, but it was really kind of cool to That's be able to cool. do something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm sure it's, you know, it's, it's, I, I assume it was not the norm. I mean, that was like a, a very cool addition to what they'd been doing over the years to have, you know, magic. Oh, yeah. No, it's very different. In fact, I think the only person I ever heard was Blackstone Jr., the magician. He was a very famous magician. And I remember him doing a show on the on the 50-yard line. But the funny thing is that he did it after me. I, I remember doing it earlier than he did. I did it in uh, 19, 1976, it. I think it was. 1976, we did it. Yeah. Yeah, and there's uh there's a lot of consideration there. Obviously, the uh, the table magic versus the fifty yard line magic. Oh, yeah. you know, the perspective oh, of the yeah. audience. It's just there's there's a lot that goes into that. Um, so what is it about magic that is so special? You know, you're you're a comedian, and you know, based right. on it, it, magic and comedy are based on the same thing, which is surprise. You know, people don't right. expect the end result. And when the end result happens, it surprises them. And yours is yeah. is just a big guffaw of laughter. And mine could right. be laughter or it could be it could be just amazement, one of the two. And they both work right. on the same timing. And so when people are surprised, you know, that's what makes them laugh. But also it's also what creates amazement as well. So comedy clubs for me have been a great uh, a great way for me to work and I, and my personality and the way that I work, cause I have kind of a, a, a funny way of performing that I think people enjoy mm -hmm. it and it works well in a comedy club as well. But what was interesting is yeah. I remember when I was um, in high school, I used to work a jazz club in New mm -hmm. Jersey called Richard's lounge, which believe it or not at the time, it was a very famous jazz club. People from all over the country would come and perform there. And one of the reasons I worked there was because they didn't want to see magic. You know, they're there to listen to nice, cool jazz. But in between the breaks, I would go on stage and do magic. And the reason I did it is because I would get hecklers. 
And because of the hecklers, <laughs> it, uh, I would always learn how to deal with a heckler on stage. Uh, so, I mean, there's, I'd say some of the times I would get, it would be like an even kind of thing where we, we would sort of just, it's like, we, we both got the same score basically. And I, I, I ended right. up, I was like, uh, kind of a little ticked off about that. But there, most <laughs> of the times I learned, I, I learned exactly how to interact. And I was, I learned not to be afraid of hecklers. In fact, right. now, if you ever saw my show and a heckler starts, you'll see me smile. You'll see me smile because, oh, you know, for go. me, it's just, I'm just, I'm just loading up. It's ready. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, I don't know. It's like a, it's like a jujitsu fighter wait, waiting for someone to pick a fight with them. You know, it's, you, you're yeah, just it's so like, well, it's like, so well trained. Like jab, jab. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, like jab, is jab, this what we're doing? Right cool. Hook. Jab, jab, right. Hook. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because you coming in as a comedian who does comedy. When when you say you did comedy clubs, are you saying that you did perform magic comedy at the clubs or were you working on your comedy solely? No, I would do magic in the comedy clubs. It's oh. funny for me. It's really right. difficult for me to be on stage without doing magic. I mean, I can and I've done speeches and I'm I'm, I'm a speaker as well. However, it's right. it's uncomfortable for me. But when I'm doing magic, Perfect. I'm much more in control. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it is interesting that you coming in as a magician, you're kind of an easy target, you know, cause it's different than what they were expecting. So you get those like knuckleheads in the crowd who, you know, have, I've had, I've had very few, uh, fortunately, but, um, but that is, it is interesting that that's what it takes. You have to enter that space and that discomfort. And it's almost that through that failure, you later go, man, I should have said this. Have you ever had that? Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Oh man, I, that would have killed. And now you've written it. Now you have the comeback to use next time. Oh yeah. I mean, I remember working the Playboy Club, and I would work with these great acts that would come in from all over the country. And one of them was Ben Powers. And Ben Powers was on mm -hmm. um, the TV show. What was the one with the JJ um, uh, Walker? Um, Good Times. He was on Good Times. And a, a, he was an incredible performer. He was a comedian, singer, impressionist. It was all together a great show. And I would open for him. And I came out there and I remember having this really drunk heckler. And no matter what I did, I couldn't get him to shut up. And I was just ticked off. And I, I went back into the oh. dressing room when I was done. But I always do my time. But I went in the dressing room when yep. I was done. And I just sat in the dressing room where normally I would go run around to the front of the house and be able to watch the show from the house because I learned from everybody yeah. who I work with. So I was in the dressing room. Ben went on stage. He's doing his act and stuff like this. And at the end, he leaves the stage, comes back stage, and he sees me in the dressing room. He went, oh, Harry. He says, I wanted to show you what to do. And he went out there and he explained to me that he comes out there singing and smiling and he's looking at the audience yeah. and he's He's, he's smiling at the people over here. And as his face turns towards the person who's heckling, you see his smile drop. Yeah. He sort of has a little bit of an attitude there. And he just keeps focusing on the other side of the room until everybody in the room started yelling at the heckler saying, will you shut up? Will you shut up? Because they realize they're not getting the right. full show. And to me, it was a really a, sure. a, just a really clever bit of business. But again, these are the kind of things you learn yeah. from from working with people. I mean, I'm so lucky with the people yeah. I work with. I mean, like Joey Bishop, who is probably one of the mm -hmm. underrated people in, in the Rat Pack. But Joey Bishop wrote a lot of the comedy that you see the Rat Pack do. And what was really interesting, yeah. because we were on the road for nine months together, and Joey really took me under his wing, and he, he taught me a lot of things. And one of the things he said, he says, he says, try a gag out or try a joke out three times. He says the first time it could be your delivery second or it could have been yeah. the audience second time. It could have been the audience yeah. or whatever. He says, but by the third time, if it doesn't work, he says, put it away. He says, and you can either rework it or try it out another time in another format or whatever. And you really learn. And, and those are the kind of tips that I, I love learning. You know, I, and I've reached a point in my life where now I'm working on a lot of cruise ships. And I remember looking up to all of the performers who are just so professional and so amazing mm. to me. And I would learn so much from them. And I still do. But I'm realizing that I'm reaching the level of the entertainer that I used to look up to. So in other yeah. words, there's other people looking up to cool. me now, and now I give them yeah. advice, the same kind of advice that I used to get. And that's the way it's sort of handed down from, from uh, performer to sure. performer. I, I feel like I'm that with you. I mean, I, I sit with you and your wife and hear like all of these tips and ideas. And we, we had one night where we... We even like wrote some some comedy bits for my set. So I oh, we got to do that again. That. I had so much fun. I, I had so much fun with that. <laughs> <Me> yeah, <too. laughs> that was so fun. Yeah, um, yeah. So let's on that note. What were some of the great 
either mentors, direct mentors, or just people you look up to inspired you? Who were your, who were your guys that you looked up to? You know, obviously the, the magicians I would see on TV. And by the way, I used to see magicians on TV and never really saw a live magician until I was already performing. I mean, other than maybe a birthday party or somebody at a mall or something right. like that. So to see a professional magician perform, I never did that. I was always performing mm -hmm. before that before I actually saw them, which really is an advantage because I'm not copying people. I'm not trying to mirror people. It's just my sure. personality that comes out and my point of view. Uh, and it's, it's a much better way to do it. And the magic I would learn was from books. So in other words, I had to read the trick itself and then adapt it to my personality and present it the way that I felt it should be done. So it was really interesting. But then there are people that I met along the way in magic. And some of them were the people I would see on TV, the people like Mark Wilson, who used to have a whole TV sh uh, mm -hmm. thing called Mad TV Magic Circus that went on for years on TV. And Mark Wilson and I, I finally got to meet him, and I really learned a lot from just from his shows alone. Doug Henning was on Broadway, and I used to go out to Broadway. I used to take, get on the bus when I was like 15 or 16. I'd, I'd get on the bus to New York, and I would catch the matinee shows there. And I must have seen the show five Amazing. times already. And I got to the point where he was really kind. He was very kind and wrote me a, wrote me a letter, which was really sweet. Um, but probably That's my amazing. best mentor was a magician named the Amazing Randy. And Randy uh, just yeah. passed away, I think, last year. And Randy, uh, Randy was a... He was the world's best escape artist since Houdini, but also in a yeah. very talented and funny magician. He looked like yep. a mean Santa Claus, but he was very, very funny. And I learned one so of my much favorites. from him. Well, you know something? If it were not for him, I don't think, I don't know how I, I would have gotten through college and stuff, only because there was so much stress. I mean, I told you about my schedule that I, I had maybe sure. four hours of sleep a night. And there's times when I was just really, really fried. You know, and Randy, yeah. I'd talk to Randy on the phone. He says, come on over. So I'd come over to the house and he would just get me involved in such incredible conversations. He used to do oh, something. I, I, I would walk into his house once. And by the way, I'll tell you about his house, which was amazing in New Jersey. Please, yeah. He had a house with this uh, theatrical head on the door. And by the way, you go up to the house and there's a placard, like a sign hanging in his front yard that says, Randy, charlatan. That's what it says, like a doctor science. <laughs> That's so funny. That's so ironic because yeah. he's like the anti charlatan. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then you go That's to awesome. the door. You go up to the door and you knock. There's a, a brass head on the door and, and with a knocker and you knock on the door and you hear the bell ring on the inside of the house. Although you're using a knocker, and out from the mouth of the head it says, "Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows." And I hear Randy say, "Come on in." And I turn the door oh, handle, man. but the door opens from the hinges. It's you know the whole house is rigged like this and, and I remember the first time i ever met him at his house he had a pair of shears because he was cutting linoleum because he was putting down new linoleum in the kitchen he had these huge yeah. shears and he took the shears and he threw them above my head and i ducked and they're just gone and that's that's the way randy was he would always do things like that so it was just so much fun that's how he but, welcomes his guests like i said yeah, but but again, there was times when I, when I was really stressed, and I would come over to the house, and he would yeah. just show me these neat gizmos. One of the gizmos he had, he said, "Name any song." Oh, he said, "No," he says, "He says hum the first five notes of any song." So I did. I hummed the first five notes of any song. He takes out a pen out of his pocket. He opens it up, and there's little strips of microfilm. He slides it in there, and he looks through the pen, which is like a microscope. He tells me the name of the song, when it was published, who the publisher was, who is the person who sang it, all this information just from me humming five notes of the song. It was amazing. And this is – when was this? 19 – probably 78. 1978 wow. probably. Yeah. That's but it was all microfilm and it was based on the idea that no matter where you start, the next note either goes up or down and the no next note from there goes up or down. And he can tell within five notes the exact song it, it was. It was very clever. He's, he's brilliant. Um, that's yeah. yeah. So what, what was some of the advice that he would give you when, you know, I guess anxiety was something you're dealing with. Or was it, was it being anxious or was it just being tired or what was, what was it he was tired and tired and stressed you. there's a lot there's a lot of stuff going on with with college and stuff so there's a lot of yeah. um there's a lot of there's a lot of stressful stuff that goes on you know uh a bit just in life and i think sure. one of the major things that he taught me is that don't let magic be the center of your entire life you got to learn other things you got to be able to go out and play golf you got to go out and do this and that learn chess whatever only because right. 
you can't be so narrowly focused that you can't relate to an audience. You want to be able to have the same experiences that an audience has. And because of that, that was a great piece of advice because there's a lot of magicians I know who are extremely talented, incredibly amazingly talented, but they can't relate to an audience. You know, they can't talk one-on-one with people. It's also interesting that to be successful like you or Randy, you do have to be obsessed. You have to be obsessed with your art. But if you're too obsessed, yes. then, then you don't connect. So it's, you almost have to pull, pull back on what's naturally there a little bit, I, I guess, is the well, advice. Here's, that- this, is a, this is an interesting observation that I made years ago. And I say, and it's going to come out wrong when I say it, but it, I'll explain what I mean when I say it. Uh, okay. I, I say you've got to care, but not too much. Okay. Sure. And the reason I'm saying that is because you've got to really care about what you do, but don't be disappointed if something goes wrong. In other words, right. you got to care, but don't let it crush you if it, if, it, if it doesn't work, if something doesn't work. So in other words, if somebody yeah. heckles you, it hasn't ruined your show. You know, it, it's not a make or break moment. You're just, you, you can laugh right. it off and move on to the next thing. Right. Yeah. It's, it's reminds me sort of of progress, not perfection. You know, you, you just have to keep mm-hmm. going and, and, um, but that does get tough, you know, especially, especially in a, in a situation like a comedian or a magician where. It's just you, you know, so everything's on you. There's nobody to blame, you know, so you right. I, you tend to take all of it very personally, I feel. Um, well, you know, that's the, that's the other interesting thing, too, is there's so many things involved in my show when, it's, when I'm working a theater or working a cruise ship or working a club where I have sound. Yeah. I've got music and, and, and that, that's behind me. I've got lighting cues that have to happen at a certain time. And there's a, there's a bunch of people that may be involved in, in getting that show sure. up and running. And I take most of the responsibility on myself right now. Right. The only thing that people really have to do is make sure the sound is on and make sure that the, uh, the, the lighting, is, which is not that critical. I can't believe how many calls I'm getting today. I can't, that's not normally that critical. <laughs> it's, um, it's money, it's uh, business. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is I, but the sound itself, like the musical cues, which are so important to my show to make it into a theatrical kind of a yeah. production. Uh, the musical cues, I run them all myself yeah. from the stage with magnetic ankle switches. I actually stand a certain way and the That's music so cool. will, will click yeah. on. The next time I do it, it fades out and cues up to the next number. And because of that, I can just literally come to a corporate date, plug in, and I'm ready to go. And it's going to be a solid show. That's it. You're, just, you're yeah. just one plug into their system and you got everything out. That's so, it. Uh, yeah, yeah, the less you have to rely, especially on like cruise ships where you're like, you're moving into these new theaters and I, I, I imagine there can be some some hiccups. So that's that's good to just put it all on you. And, um, I was going to ask about technology and I wasn't sure, you know, where the line was of things that you share publicly or not, but I love that you shared mm-hmm. the ankle click. What are they called? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. What are they called? Hmm. Uh, that was called an MP3 tech or there's, there's also a media star is another one. It's the same, same company that makes them. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and like I like said, you're I, lo- tapping I love them with it. your hand. Or your, your feet? No, or it's my, what's, it's, what's, they're connected okay. to my, <clears throat> my ankles. I actually stand a certain way and there's a yeah. magnet on one leg and the, and the remote is on the other with a, a reed awesome. switch in it. And when they get close enough, it'll start the music off. <clears throat> you know, it's really interesting years ago. And I'm talking years ago, I used to use cassette tapes yeah. and every single piece of music was on a separate cassette tape. And in a show, wow. in let's say a half hour show, we would have maybe eight to 10 cassette tapes you know, that they would just take and put in. It's already queued up. They just push the button and it plays, but they have to do it at the right time. And if they're off by just a couple of seconds, it makes the show drag. You know, it's like, it's not where it needs to be. And I remember the first time I started using this unit, this MP3 tech, my wife was saying to me, she says, isn't that going to be distracting to you? I said, no, what's distracting is when the music is not there. That's what throws me off. Yeah. And there's, there's less variables there. Remembering to put it on the right cue, remembering to rewind it, whatever. Yeah. Being distracted. There's just less, less that can go wrong. That's awesome. Yeah. I was going to ask you, yeah, how has technology changed over, over your career? Ooh, that's interesting. I mean, how yeah, has it um, changed your, your act over the career? Well, I think, I think the most important thing for me is the thing like the music, you know, when you can use technology for that, um, I started using a lot more video in the shows, 
especially in larger mm-hmm. theaters where I can do some really nice production pieces that interact with the, the, the video itself. So it makes it much a larger production. I like things like that and adding scenery that are LED walls that these incredible backgrounds that you can use to be able to make, to really enhance the show. So those things I like, but using technology and magic itself, which is possible, there's a lot of a lot of um, apps and a lot of um, gimmickry that's that's very mechanical. But to me, it takes yeah. away fairness to the audience. I, I don't like it. Uh, there's a lot of it I don't like. Uh, so I, I kind of stay away from that. I'm a, much more of a purist. But also, if you've seen my show, I don't use a lot of box tricks. I don't use these big boxes and these contraptions where people would appear and right, things like right. this. My magic is real organic. I use I use um, sure. a lot of natural Cards objects. And... I may borrow a watch or I may borrow money or I'll, yeah. I'll use envelopes or I have a picture frame or just borrowed wedding rings. or it, Everything I use is apparently from the audience's point of view – very natural objects. And that's what I like about the style of magic that I do. Do you find that that is more relatable? Yeah, because absolutely. People can't relate. They've never seen a huge box with a mirror and a big wheel. You know, it's not something they've seen before, but if it's something they've seen before, it's almost this, oh, I could, I could maybe do that. Or I have that, or I have a watch or why didn't I know a watch could do that? I don't know. Is there something to that where it's that pure, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like you see this related. box where something appears in it, and the first excuse is, well, it's a magic box. You know, there's some sort of, <laughs> right, sort of trickery right, right. in the box, you know, <laughs> right. where you don't know like, what it is, but you know it's there. Yeah. Uh, right. Like the opening of my show, the opening of my show, I borrow three wedding rings from the audience, and their ring, it's their right. rings, and I link them together. And then I bring them on stage to verify that they really are their rings. And I think something wow. like that is so impossible. It's their own right. objects. They're verifying that it's theirs. Right, and then right, I will right, unlink right, them right. one by one. And on big stages, we zoom in with a camera and they can actually see me unlink the rings and, and see them linked together and stuff like that. So, I mean, th- that's the kind of stuff yeah. that I like to do. And in fact, we were talking about comedy clubs and hecklers. When I do something that's that yeah. impossible as my first trick, then I've earned their respect. And I, I, I think because of that, I don't get a lot of hecklers. Right. That's yeah. They they don't they now don't want to mess up the show, even selfishly for them. You know. They, they, they well, they don't think, think it's a hokey magic, magic show anymore. They think they think more like, holy cow, this is pretty good. Gotcha. You know, and and because of that, you know, right, they they give right, me a little right. bit more respect and they give me they're a little more in. benefit of the doubt. You know, whereas in, they're waiting for that's comedy, good. and there is comedy involved in that routine, but it's um you know it's 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 it, it's something that's a powerful piece of magic that really gets people yeah. amazed and uh and earns their trust that's so cool um one of the things that i've learned is that being good at something and being good at the business are very different so mm-hmm. let's talk about um you know being a magician versus running the business uh, you know um, did you, did you run into challenges where there, do you have, you know, what kind of advice do you have for people who are trying to make a business out of their passion? What, what sort of well, things you know, did so you the, run into or advice you can give? Show, show business has two words. It's show and business. And you'll notice which one is, is right. bigger than the other. I mean, business is a big <laughs> yeah. aspect of, of what you're going to do. If you can't market yeah. yourself and you can't sell yourself and you have no system involved to be able to make things work, you're relying upon agents to book you. And an agent will put you, and this is, I learned this real early on, he'll put you where he can make money. And if he can lock you into something where he doesn't even have to lift up the phone anymore and you're stuck there doing it forever, that's what he'll do. You know, and it, yeah. it, but you're not heading in the direction that you want to head. So if you want to stay right. in control of your career and you want to be able to advance and you want to be able to try different markets, then you really need to start booking yourself as well. I'm not saying anything bad about agents. I mean, I still work with agents and I have a good relationship yeah. with many of them there. But um, a, a lot of the marketing I do on my own. And because of that, I can head into the directions I want to. You know, January and February, I tour. You know, and I do that every year and I, I enjoy doing those. The, the, the corporate dates that I do for the holiday season every December, I'll, I'd say at least 99 percent of those are booked by me by me directly. Um, mm. uh, so things like that. The cruise ships, I do work through in agencies because they have a better relationship with the, uh, the cruise lines than I would have. Um, there are right. some cruise lines I've worked with independently. Uh, because they know who I am. They know what I do. They know that I deliver. And because of that, we have a good relationship and they'll call me directly or they'll accept my call 
and they'll they'll give me the dates that I you know that I'm looking for. So you know, there's um I, I think it's important for people to understand the business part of it as well. Now you are you're a businessman, you know, and you understand marketing, and I think it's sure. I think it's really important that even if you're not going to do your own marketing or your own advertising, that at least you should have a handle on it to understand it, you know, enough that if somebody wants to market for you, you understand what they're doing. And you can also see when it's not working, you know, so I think that's important, but I, I, the business aspect that is very, very important. I mean, I'm, I'd say, I'd say most of my work is sitting at my desk and doing the marketing. I mean, even today I was up at like nine, you know, doing, doing calls and, and, uh, and sending out emails and letters and stuff. Yeah. 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 It's all, all the behind the scenes stuff. Um, yeah, that is, that is a really big part of it. Um, so tell me about the community of magicians. I I noticed that when I got into comedy, it was just this really amazing community. Is, is there a, a a community of magicians, people you stay in touch with, meet out on the road? What's that like? There, there, it's rare that you'll work with another magician, unless it's a magic right. convention. You're not going to really work with a lot of magicians. It's not like a comedy club where comedians will get together and you see each other in different right. places and stuff, you know, which is really fun. And I love that. Yeah. I think that's one of the things I like the most about comedy clubs is you'll work with somebody. Yeah. Oh, I like him. I worked with him before. Right. Uh, there's right. a couple of magic nightclubs that bring in a couple of magicians at a time. But otherwise, it's rare that you would have that kind of a community that you would have in a uh, in a comedy community. Also, because magic is so select, there's a lot of thievery involved, and there's thievery in comedy. But um, I'd say magic; yeah. it might be even more difficult. Yeah, I, I really? you know where people are really looking over your shoulders. They want to see what you're doing. They're going to copy you, and uh, because they because it's a trick. Yes, they can put their own spin on it, but still, they'll take. Uh, they'll take an entire routine that you've spent two years working on and just take it. Right. You know? Yeah. Oh, and there's no policing. I mean, I, I imagine it's tough to, to win a lawsuit or and what do you do? It's, it's very, very, it's very, very yeah. rare that you could David Copperfield right. try to protect one of his illusions, which is one of the greatest illusions is this. I don't know if you ever saw him do his flying where he literally, lifts himself just like you would dream of doing he lifts himself off the ground and flies out across the stage and he actually brings somebody up from the audience a girl out of the audience he lifts him up in his his arms like superman and literally flies around the stage with her and it's really one of the most impressive illusions and to protect it he patented it which is stupid because now that's a public document (laughs) and you could actually go to the patent office and say I want this patent number, whatever, whatever, and you give this. And actually, the, right. and I, I did because I it wanted it just from my library. I, it's about a good 20 yeah. pages of details exactly how the trick works and how the uh, the, the mechanisms work. Yeah, that's, that's so tricky. It's not, you can't really protect magic. It's very difficult. Right. Right. Uh, so tell us about your wife and how y'all met. Oh, my gosh. Carol, Carol Ann and I met on crew on a cruise ship. When I first started working on mm-hmm. ships years ago, she was the nurse on the ship. And at the end of the evening, we would all meet at midnight yeah. buffet. All the entertainers would meet there and she would end up hanging out with the, with the entertainers because we're fun. So we'd hang out and we would start talking and she right. and I got into conversations that suddenly everybody's gone. And I look at my watch and it's four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, holy cow. And this would happen <laughs> night after night. We'd have these great, yeah. great conversations. And I remember one night we were talking about um, vitamin B12 shots because the the British entertainers were talking about how beneficial and how wide awake they were after having vitamin B12. And Carol Ann, my wife, said, oh, yeah, we have that in the hospital. I said, could I get a vitamin B12 shot? She says, sure, you can come down to office hours at 8 in the morning. I'm like, I don't get up at 8. I'm an entertainer. I get up at the crack of noon. And she's like, well, I I said, "Can, can we do it now? And she says, you want it now? All right, come on down. So I went down to the hospital and I'm rolling up my sleeve. She says, oh no, that's not where it goes. So I actually had to <laughs> drop my crazy. drawers and she took the needle and she did what's called barbing the needle because she wanted to really, she didn't like me. She says she didn't like me, but she- Oh, that's she, hilarious. She, yeah, she barbed the needle of, she actually jammed it into the bottle so the needle would be bent a little bit. And then she she- stuck oh it in my God. butt and and she's and it didn't hurt me at all she said did that hurt i'm like nope <laughs> not at all she was kind of disappointed nope. in that and so that's how we first met and yeah. she was she was engaged at the time was your first date? and um 
I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. No, no, she was engaged. I, again, this was just a friendship and a conversation and talking about vitamin B12 shots. Oh, yeah, yeah. But our conversations were right, great. Right. And she, eventually her fiance yeah. came onto the ship and she and her fiance, they had a real bad breakup, you know, at that point. And she was upset. And I said, yeah. hey, do you want to go to dinner? You know, we were in St. Thomas. Would you like to go out to dinner? And she says, I have nothing to wear but yeah. my engagement dress. I said, well, you're not going to be using that. Why don't you put that on? So she did. And we went out to dinner in St. Thomas. <laughs> and that was our first That's date. Beautiful. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's amazing. Oh, and, um, and, and, and you and Carol Ann actually performed together, right? Yeah. And she became part of the show. She would initially... Uh, be helping me run the music and to make sure that the cues are right. Mm -hmm. And she'd be in the booth actually letting people know the cues for the lighting and let them know what's coming up in advance. Uh, And little by little, she started working in the show. And she now does some of the magic in the show where she does this incredible mind reading that's uh, that's part of our stage show. She does does this this amazing uh, escape that she does on stage. That's and, and again, everything is very, it's, it's not like we have boxes and stuff like this. Um, she's, she's tied up with, uh, with like 20 feet of rope by a member of the audience. And I have wow. both him and her stand inside of a curtain hoop. And I have him stand, he's standing in front. I say, face front. I said, put your arms at your side. I said, just smile and don't move. And I lift up the, lift up the curtain that surrounds them. I count the three when I drop it. I say, where's your jacket? And he looks and his jacket is off of his body. It's gone. And Carolyn wow. steps out from behind him and she's now wearing the jacket underneath the ropes. She's still tied up with the original knots. And the guy and I have to untie her to take, a, take it all, all the ropes off so they can get his jacket back. So, I mean, it, it, she does awesome. some amazing stuff. <clears throat> yeah, that's incredible. And she's, uh, she's so fun. And, and I just love hearing all yeah. y'all's stories. Um, <laughs> I mean... Like I never want dinner to end. So what are, what are like some of the, just over your career, what are some of the strange just situations or amazing moments or what just sticks out to you the most over your career? Um, people or places. There's a lot of mafia stuff that went on, you know, in, in our, in our, our, our lives, which was interesting. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I wasn't going to bring a, a, it up, but I'm glad you did. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's 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 just in, it's, it's it's interesting. I mean, and this is uh, historically, I mean, entertainers and the and the, uh, people in the mafia have just loved hanging out with the entertainers, and they're really they're great people. They're not going to yeah. hurt you unless you do something stupid. In fact, in yeah. Vegas. Um, right. You know, Vegas was so much better when the mafia ran it. I have club owners tell me they said it was so much better when the mafia ran this. <laughs> <laughs> they said you could walk around with hundred dollar bills sticking out of your pocket. And nobody would touch you because if they did, nobody they'd be dead. You. you know, but now it's all accountants right. and it's right. all business and it's it's not, it's not as much fun as it used to be. People, are, you know, today right. don't realize that Frank Sinatra. You know, later in life, when the the accountants took over, yeah, he's on stage and you have to pay $100 to go see his show. At the time when he was in Vegas and when he was famous, you wouldn't pay anything to go see him. You would perform in the lounge Mm. or at the time he would perform when he did Live at the Sands, which is when when he and uh, Sammy Davis Jr. and uh, Dean Martin were together. You would go and have dinner and the show and the entire dinner and show would cost five bucks. You know, that's it. And then you'd see wow. these three stars on stage. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, you also travel quite a bit, you and your wife. What, yeah, I'd say we spend the... probably 25% of our, our, our year is probably traveling around the world. Yeah. yeah. What I find really cool, because you just went on a, a cruise recently that, uh, that you worked on. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you're on the cruise. You perform twice a week, right? Yes. Twice and then the a rest week. of the time you're on a cruise. <laughs> like that's it. Like to you, me, you, that's yeah. like the greatest hack in the world. <laughs> <laughs> you it's know, you get to, you get to go to the island and do the thing. Yeah. 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 You're, I mean, you were I'd in, say uh, 90, Hawaii recently. Yeah. I mean, most of, most of the, the, um, the, the engagement, you're, you're basically a passenger, you know, so you're actually sitting there yeah. and you can do everything that the passengers do and you, you get to go out and go ashore and do all the stuff that they do. And, um, and, and yes, and it's all, it's all paid for, you know, it's all part of the contract, 
you know, I always joke around and I say to people, you know, in, in many cases, I'd rather commute, you know, fly me in, do the show and fly me home because I got stuff I could be doing right now. So, you know, when you're yeah. out on a ship and it sounds great and it really is good, but you have to realize that yeah. everything you have at home stays on hold, stays on hold. Right. And I remember when I was in, even when I was in college and I, I took a leave of absence from college to start working on the cruise ships. And even the, at the time, my mother would say, you know, why do you maintain an apartment? Why do you, why do you keep an apartment? I said, because I know I could be in the middle of making something and I could leave it sitting on the desk. I can leave for six months and come back. It's exactly oh. where I left it. And I can pick up right. right where I left off, you know, otherwise, you know, you're sharing a place with a play with somebody and all the stuff gets packed up or moved and you can't find anything anymore. You know, I, I can be mid midstream and something and stop. And then uh, go do the the contract. Come back and pick up right where I left off. I um, by the way, what what's the what's the painting in your living room when you first walk into the left? The lady on the boat, a lady of Shalott. Uh, a I John saw Waterhouse that somewhere painting. else. Yeah, mm -hmm. I saw that in the world, and I was like, oh, I know what that is, and I told someone the story of it. So. You guys are yeah, it's in the Leeds pictures. Museum in 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 in, in yeah. Uh, England. In, yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. Actually, um, it's it's the centerpiece of the of the museum. Yeah, is it okay? Um, but your house is so eclectic with like things from all over the world, um, and and so you know if I if I were to go travel, uh, and I haven't seen much. I've I've been to Italy. That's the only place I've been overseas, uh, been which is a beautiful Central place. America, very so good. It was great. Um, yeah, but like where where would you recommend I go? Where what do I have to see? Oh, my two favorite places. I love Venice. I love Venice, uh, Venice, Italy. And I, and I mean, to me, that's just such a magical place. And it took so me different. probably three trips, uh, three contracts uh, in the area until I realized what was so neat about it is that everything okay. echoes. It's all it's all an echoey kind of a place. But as you turn the corner because of all the stone walls. There could be a, 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 a group of people around you and you hear sort of the noise of the echoing of those people around you. And as soon as you pass that corner, it's silent. It's a whole nother area. It has this whole surrealistic kind of feel to it. So it, it really becomes very magical. And I like that place. I really love that. Yeah. So that's one of the yeah. places I like. The other one is I love uh, Thailand. I have a great time in Thailand. Okay. Um, uh, in, in fact, we're, we're, make, we're planning a trip just for ourselves to go back to Thailand next year, probably in February, I think we're going to go. Um, I, I, I have a tailor out there who actually makes my, my stage suits, the, nice. the tuxedos I wear on stage. Um, and we yeah. have a driver out there who actually probably gets more business than I get. And uh, I built yeah. his website for him. And, um, and uh, again, we go, out, yes. we go out there and have a great, great time. I mean, and our driver is with us from the day that we start until the time we start in the daytime until we end. So it usually ends up being like nine in the morning until like four in the morning. And he's with us that entire time. And uh, awesome. we never open a door, a car door. He opens the doors for us. He opens the other doors. He carries our bags for us. He has a cell phone. He makes yes. reservations at these restaurants. And I think one of the advantages of traveling as much as we do is that you get to know the places. You'll go back. You can drop yeah. me off usually in any major city, and I can tell you exactly the places I want to go to. I know where I am. I know where I'm going. And I think that yep. was one of the interesting things to me when Dan Brown started writing his books, you know, the uh, the uh, yeah, Angels yeah, yeah. and Demons and, and the, sure. the Da Vinci Code. He has such so a good. wonderful way of writing that is not so – obvious he won't say i'm standing on the corner of such and such such and such he'll say things like you know there's a, the, the thing is behind me and i i, I there, uh he'll talk about the sun setting at a certain point and i say i know exactly where he's standing i know exactly where he is you know and it's so oh, interesting wow. because he's 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 detailed in a way that's not obvious and and because of that the it's really it's really kind of cool it. yeah that is that is neat uh yeah i loved venice just I only went there once. We were there for a day, but just getting lost, you just like not looking at the map and just taking turns nonstop. And then it's like dead end garden, private. Okay. Back. Ooh, the shop. <laughs> yeah. Like it's like, it's like elaborate shop that you would have, you know, it's, it's just, there's so much, there's so much in there. Um, and, uh, and then, and then you get out in the open and there's just these beautiful, like chapels and, and, and you go in and there's just, it's just a museum full of things you've never seen before. I mean, it was just uh, yeah. it was an incredible, incredible trip. 
Um, so lastly, I'd love to talk about what you're doing over at Pilatos. Tell us about oh, that. Yeah, at Pilatos. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working yeah. different different restaurants. Uh, and actually, we're just well, it's not set yet. We have another place that we're, we're going to be doing this as well. Um, we'll, awesome. we'll find a venue that has a great uh, banquet room that can seat at least 50 mm-hmm. people. And we, we put a more intimate show into that room and we'll set the whole thing up like a little tiny showroom. And, and again, there's only mm-hmm. so much we can do. I can't make it into a real theater, but we make it into a showroom and we have a dinner and show package. And what's really interesting is that we started this about a year ago. And I'd say every month that we do this, we've, so, we've, we've sold out or nearly sold out every single show. And we just did one yeah. um, just a two, a three, three or four days ago. Three or four days ago, we just did our last one, and we just did. Um, um, I think we were maybe seven people short of a full house. Uh, so it was, it was, and awesome. it, again, it was a, it was a great, great crowd. We had a great time, and because of the holiday season, you know, we're not going to be able to do this in December, you know, because they're booked and mm-hmm. I'm booked for for those periods of time. Mm-hmm. But also January, I'm on tour, so I can't do it then. But we're going to pick it up again in February, and it, it, like I said, it's a, it's a lot of fun, and. I do the shows uh, myself and I'll switch the shows around quite a bit, you know, each time that I do it. But when I reach what I consider a saturation point where people have seen me enough, I'll start bringing other performers in. And I started bringing people in who were on masters of illusion on TV. Uh, One person Mm -hmm. who's a a two time award winning magician. I brought him in. There's another magician from, um, uh, from Austin who had his own Las Vegas show for seven years at the Maxim Hotel, and I'm going to be bringing wow. him in as well. So, I mean, we've got a nice collection of magicians who have really good street credit, you know. So it's 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 it's, yeah. it's been a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, uh, you you had me open on one of your shows, and uh, it went really well. It was a great crowd. Uh, yeah, they were time. fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, one more question: um, What yeah, what sure. do you love? What do you love about what you do? Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. I, you know, I never really time. thought about that. I, I think I just enjoy, I enjoy entertaining people. I enjoy creating joy, you know, uh, you know, yeah. when, when you see people smile and applaud and have a good time and, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, you get that whole slap on the back where people are like, oh man, I had such oh. a great time. It was a lot of fun. You know, good. that kind of stuff yeah. is just so empowering and, and it's so, it so is. invigorating. You know, you can't have coffee and stuff like that. I remember the, uh, you know, there's there's times when the shows aren't great, you know, and you sit there and go, Ugh. and at the end of the just, night, you're just oh, wiped so out. Yeah, I mean, all yeah, of your yeah, energy yeah. is gone because you've given and given and given and you didn't get anything back. Yeah. And whether it's the yeah. audience or whether it was the conditions of the show or just the audience at that point just was not that happy. You know, it's right. uh, it, it's exhausting. But when you get an audience who's just having so much fun and they laugh and you end on such a high note, you can't go to sleep. You're up until four oh, in the morning. It's the best. It's no, the it is. Best. It I is. remember I remember the drives home, but like after bombing at like open mics, just existential dread. Like, what am I doing? And then <laughs> and then I mean you hit those you hit those shows like when I did the improv and it's just there's nothing you can compare it to until you do it. You, you can't describe it. You just, you just have to be there. Uh, but it's, it's quite an experience. Yeah. It um, must be very, very difficult for somebody who's never been in entertainment to really understand what that feeling is like. Yeah, You're right. It, 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 I mean, yeah. as an entertainer, you felt yeah. it, you, you've so experienced, you've been there, but I mean, to try to relate it to anything else, I can't relate. I, I can't figure out a way to explain it to somebody. Yeah. It's just, it's just awesome. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, let me know when, when we can get together again soon. Yeah. I want to um, do that. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Love oh, to get Caroline together. just, ho- she just hollered and said to say hi. Hi, Carol. How are you? <laughs> She's good. Tell her, to, tell, her, <laughs> tell her to check the schedule and we'll, we'll put something on there. Um, Absolutely. all right. Once again, we're, we're Harry Maurer. Uh, you're a great person, uh, world, uh, world class comedian, good friend. Thank you so much for, for all the support you've given me uh, in, in, in marketing and in entertainment. I'm really happy to know you. So uh, take care. Uh, have a good day. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks. All right. All right. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.